Our guest today is president of DePaul University. He is the 12th president of DePaul, the nation's largest Catholic university, and he is the first lay leader in DePaul's history. Our guest today oversees a $599 million budget with 22,700 students on two major Chicago campuses with more than 2,400 full-time and 1,150 part-time faculty and staff. Approximately 50,000, 50,000 DePaul alumni live within the city of Chicago limits, while nearly 120,000 DePaul alumni live in the greater metropolitan area. Dr. Esteban and his wife, Josephine, this is how smart he is. Say hi to Josephine, his wife. City Club of Chicago, welcome. He's so smart, he brought his wife. He and his fabulous wife live in Lincoln Park. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gabriel Esteban. Gabe, there we go. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Uh, let me just acknowledge uh, one other individual who was acknowledged earlier, Michelle Smith, uh, who's alderman of uh, Chicago's 43rd Ward. Uh, we've been great partners with her over the years. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge my colleague presidents who I've gotten to know, uh, Michael, Ali, and Devin. Uh, thank you for joining me this uh, afternoon. Today, my topic is going to be something which is near and dear to our hearts, uh, both me and my wife. And if you didn't notice, the university presidents with us today share something in common with both me and Joe. We're all immigrants to this country, and we actually talked about this uh, when I met them. And one of the things which brought us to this country was higher education. And one of the tenets, or one of the cornerstones, of American society, one of our long-held beliefs was the belief that it's through higher education that someone is able to become upwardly mobile. That's part of the American dream, other than appearing in a, your own reality show. <laughs> uh, and that's something which I think is something we have to think of very carefully. This is a quote from St. Vincent de Paul. And he talks about per perfection being constant perseverance. And in today's world, we're always taught that in order to advance, one must persevere. Yet, recent data shows it's become increasingly difficult for today's youth to become upwardly mobile. And for today's talk, I'll use primarily material from the Equal Opportunity Project. Uh, which was uh, funded by a number of prominent foundations and led by economists from uh, Stanford, Berkeley, and Brown University. And their interest was social mobility, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But one of the things they found was that in 1940, social mobility was true for about 90% of those born in 1940. And I'll define so, uh, social mobility, which is basically income mobility. By 1980s, that fell to 50%. So quite a significant drop. And that's continued to drop. Mobility fell in all 50 states. And the biggest drops were in Michigan and Illinois. And the study, they say the sharp drop is due to lower GDP or gr uh, gross domet domestic product and greater inequality in the distribution of growth. Is this American dream really fading for our future generations? Reports from our Chicago public school districts suggest otherwise. The, the Chicago Consortium on School Research published a report late last month where they looked at all Chicago public school high schools. And if you note, CPS has made impressive great 
uh, gains in college enrollment. Okay, it's now 44% versus 33% just a decade ago. That's for four-year institutions. This significantly outpaces that the national average for uh, schools located in poor, lower income neighborhoods. That average is 29%. So our, our own Chicago public schools now have one of the highest four-year college enrollment rates for large urban districts. Okay. And I'll return to this in a little bit. But what happens once our lower income students enter college? Are they successful after they graduate? And if education is a social mobility mechanism, are colleges and universities in Chicago and in the country opening the doors to greater opportunity for lower income students? Okay. Let's, start looking, let's start by looking at social mobility nationally. So what I'll do is I'll talk about social mobility nationally, go into the state, then I'll talk about DePaul's case in particular. One of the things the group came up with was a mobility scorecard. Okay. And this looks at it nationally. And I'll define social mobility in the next couple of slides. Okay. So what this basically shows is that some states lower income kids are more upwardly mobile than other states. So the blue states show higher levels of upward mobility. So Illinois is smack in the middle, basically, in terms of upward mobility. So this, this group of economists, they actually were one of the first, or actually the first, I think, who tracked 10.8 million students. That's how large their sample was from 2,463 institutions of higher learning. And what they did is they tracked the income of the parents of these students coming in using information like from your Pell Grants and so on. Then they tracked how much these kids make 10 years after they graduated and where they ended up in terms of income, right? So you'd say that if higher education is the gateway to social mobility, someone from the lowest 20%, you hope, moves up to that top 20%, or maybe even top 40%, or maybe top 1%. Okay. One of the findings is that a significant number of colleges do not serve their students well with regard to social mobility. Okay. And they found that some of the best in terms of social mobility were what we consider to be mid-tier public institutions. Number one actually was Cal State, uh, California State University, Los Angeles. And I'm familiar with Cal State, having gone to school in California. And with them, their social mobility index was 10%. Okay. And I'll explain what makes that up. So Cal State System Colleges did well. UT campuses, University of Texas campuses also did well. So what is social mobility? So this is a definition. Okay. So not only does a college, okay, you look at the success rate and access. The access is the fraction of students who come from the bottom 20% in terms of income. And success are the kids who come from the bottom 20% and make it to the top 20% income. And if you multiply those two, you get what they call the social mobility rate or mobility rate. I'll interchange that social mobility rate, income mobility rate, and so on. But that's how they define it. Okay. And if you're interested, they have a very large data set, actually, which comprises all institutions they were able to study. Okay. So what does this mean? I'll give you an example. At Harvard University, 3% of their students come from the bottom 20%, okay, 3%. And that's about average for the IB plus, which they define, okay. So what does this compare? The top 1% of income, okay, that accounts for 15.4% 
of Harvard's students. These are undergrads. In fact, if you were to combine the bottom 60% in terms of income, more than half, that's actually less as a percentage than the top uh, 1%. That's a school such as Harvard. Okay. Even a selective uh, public, one of the most selective publics is Berkeley. You see Berkeley. 8% of their students come from the top 20%, not bottom 20%. In fact, for the Ivies, if your income as a parent puts you in the top 1% of the income bracket, you're 77 times more likely to get into one of the Ivy Plus universities than if you are at the bottom 20%. Okay, but that's just how the numbers kind of work out. Okay. So one of the factors is the success rate. Okay, and one of the interesting findings they had was that if in fact you got into an Ivy, your income to a large degree really doesn't matter. What determines your success later is the type of institution you get into. Okay, so they found difference, but not too large a difference. If you're wealthy, top 20%, you got into Harvard versus you're in the bottom 20%. So success in the Ivies is quite high. Okay. So that's one piece. The second piece is access. Okay, which shows you the difference, right? All to the left, it's more difficult to get into these Ivies. Ivies Plus includes Stanford, uh, MIT, Chicago, and Duke. And Northwestern would fall into the other elite institution schools. So between those two, I think that's about 100 plus schools, it, uh, acceptance is 3 to 4% if you're in the lower 20%. Okay. So if you multiply this, you can see what the answers are going to look like. Right? Okay. So where do our students then go to school? CPS. Right. This just shows you where they come. And you see the large spike for our sister institution, Loyola. That's about the time they started Arupe College. By and large, DePaul has been the largest uh, one of the largest in the state, well, the largest if you're, if you're a private nonprofit, uh, for our CPS graduates. So we're able to accommodate quite a few. Uh, obviously, this does not include our sister institutions in the public sector. So what do the social mobility rates? And for those of you in, in, who are interested, uh, I could not disaggregate the University of Illinois system data because I knew, I know Michael's uh, university would do extremely well with social mobility. Okay. Uh, because, and it's primarily because of access. And it's very different from Urbana because access is very different. Okay, that makes a big difference. So IIT does extremely well. Uh, and a large part of it also has to do with the type of programs. They have strong engineering and so on. But this just shows you where everything is. If I put the University of Illinois system there, they're at 2.1%. Okay. And this data is available for every uh, institution they, they study. Okay. So now I'll focus a little bit on DePaul and who we are as an institution. Okay, DePaul is there. We say we're a private university with a very public mission. And that's a coin I attribute. I saw the provost uh, uh, make that statement in one of his interviews, and that's the attraction. Okay, we're a very, we have a very public mission in terms of who we serve. So who do we serve? This is from fall 2017 data, our freshmen a third of our freshmen are first generation. And I know in this room, a number of you are also first generation college. 34% okay. are Pell eligible. Okay, which means that if they're a state resident, they're probably eligible for MAP as well. 29% okay. 
are students of color from underrepresented groups. If we were just to look at all students of color, then you're looking at closer to 38, 39%. Okay. And 19% of our freshmen are from Chicago. The intersection of all of this is roughly 6%. So that's one group we serve. Okay. And that's why things such as Pell and MAP are very important. For this fall, we had close to 3,700 students had MAP grants. Okay. We're the largest private nonprofit recipient of MAP students. Okay. And we do a good job in educating our students. Okay. If you look at the graduation rates, national versus DePaul, if you're a Pell Grant recipient nationally, your graduation rate is going to be 51.9%. That's uh, over six years, not four. DePaul, we're at 69. And if you're non-Pell, it's 71. So even the gap between the Pell eligible and the non-Pell eligible at DePaul is smaller. We also graduate them at higher rates than the national average. Another group of students we also serve other than the freshmen, obviously, are transfers. We're the fourth largest uh, transfer recipient in the state. So our transfers are from all over. City College is a great partner. Uh, suburban uh, community colleges and other two and four years. Okay. And it's remained fairly constant. Okay. Uh, we're number five, not four. And at every commencement, roughly half of our students crossing the stage are transfer students. So we work very closely with our partners. I told you I'd get back to Chicago Public School students. So this just shows you how they do at DePaul. They represent roughly 13% of our freshmen. The four-year graduation rate of CPS students at DePaul is 48%. For the non-CPS students, it's 58.7%. That's four years. So there's close to 11 percentage point gap. However, if you look at the six-year graduation rate, it's 69% for our CPS students and 72.5% for non-CPS. So the gap kind of closes. And a large part of it has to do with all the other things our students typically have to do. Okay. They work one, two extra jobs just to help make ends meet. Okay. Sometimes they drop out. Okay. But we do work closely with them. Okay. We have a center for access and attainment. And we work with CPS. And this is a free five-week seminar on campus, which we offer to rising uh, sophomores and junior. It's hosted at our Lincoln Park campus. And we have about 75 participants, and we're trying to expose them to life and prepare them for life on a university campus. We also work on, uh, with partner with CPS on what we call the Male Initiative Project, which focuses on African American and Latino males in CPS. And we help provide school-based peer mentoring and leadership development among our partner schools. And we have an annual student development retreat which brings about 300 males of color to our campus in hopes of trying to get them to consider college moving forward. Okay. So these are the students we serve. And I think we serve them well. At DePaul, we've earned national recognition for our academic programs. We've been named one of the top 25 most innovative schools by U.S. News and World Report. We've been called a top school for service learning, which is again part of who we are, that service component. Our entrepreneurship programs, undergrad, graduate, are both top 25. Uh, cinematic arts, top 19, number 19 in the country. Last night we were at the gala for our theater school. and. Uh, a uh, side note, uh, I digress a little bit. Uh, I think uh, I've reached the acme of my career 
at Nepal because I got to meet, my wife and I got to meet John C. Riley. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know John, don't know John C. Riley, he's the star of such classics such as Chicago, Boogie Nights, Gangs of New York, and more importantly, Talladega Nights. <laughs> uh, the legend of Ricky Bobby. Uh, <laughs> And having lived for 16 years in the South, Texas and Arkansas, that was really, really big. <laughs> okay. And our theater program has been ranked number one, actually, in the country uh, by Onstage Blog, our BFA program, and number 18 in the world by The Hollywood Reporter. Our digital gaming has been recognized as number 11 by Animation Career Review ahead of Georgia Tech, UCLA, and all, all these other large public institutions. So I think we do a good job of providing the education our students need. And I thought I'd throw in some other interesting tidbits, because this shows DePaul's mobility rates as compared to our selective, private selective institution counterparts in the state. Okay. So as you can see, we serve slightly more in terms of access, lowest 20 percentile, a uh, little less for 40 and so on. But our success rate is quite high and I think it's because of our reputation and everything else that our faculty and staff put into it. I thought it might be interesting since basketball season is upon us <laughs> uh, that I throw this in which shows how we compare it to the Big East. Okay. Uh, and if you notice, there's another Vincentian school, St. John's in New York, uh, which is also Vincentian, and my previous institution, Seton Hall University, which was named after a, a daughter of charity, also part of the congregation of the mission. And before I forget, I was remiss in not thanking our Vincentian priests and other members of clergy for being here today. Because of them, you have DePaul. Because of them, you have St. John's. Because of them, you have Niagara in this country. And you see that uh, where we are in terms of who we serve. Okay, this shows you mobility rates. Okay. And I also thought it might be helpful for us to look at some of our Catholic counterparts from across the country. So I left St. John's here because they're way ahead of everyone else. Uh, and if you look, some of the well-known Catholic institutions like Georgetown, Boston College, uh, Notre Dame, and if you add Villanova, Villanova is 1.3, right where St. Louis is. Okay. Their social mobility rates are lower than schools such as DePaul. And a large part of it has to do with the income. Georgetown, are there any Georgetown alum here? Okay. <laughs> it's okay, I mean Jack DeHoy and I are good friends, so I can, uh, but Georgetown in terms of Pell eligibility, you're looking at 11, 12%, so with Villanova. So a school like, a university like DePaul, we have about three times that percentage-wise versus a school like uh, uh, Georgetown or Villanova. So that accounts for that big, big difference. Yeah. In terms of job outcomes, this just shows you uh, what happens to our students when they, once they graduate. Uh, we're able to place most of our students, uh, you, the typical measure is six months after graduation. Uh, this is roughly anywhere from, depending on the year, 15 to 20 points above the national average in terms of job placements. At the end of the day, it's about the students finding jobs in the area they're looking for jobs and or doing the graduate work they want to do. Okay. And our alumni go places. Justice Burke uh, is one of our proud alumni. Uh, just recently, and I'll just mention two individuals, Rami Nashashibi just won the Genius Award, the MacArthur Genius Award, uh, for, for his work uh, with, in the Chicago, uh, Chicago uh, Lawn neighborhood. He founded the nonprofit Inner City Muslim Action Network. And we have another uh, genius awardee, Terrell McCraney. So if you saw Moonlight, he was a DePaul graduate, and he's now chair of playwriting at Yale. 
So those are just two examples, recent examples of relatively young alum who've made their mark in society. Okay. So the question I pose to this group is what not only what must be done, but what should be done. Okay. As an institution, one of the things we pledge to continue to do is to continue to advocate for programs that allow and increase access. Programs such as MAP and PEL are near and dear to our heart. Because if the society is about social mobility, then we have to support higher ed. It's a lot cheaper than building prisons. Okay? I mean, it's uh, one thing which shocked me. I lived, when I lived in Texas, this was in the 90s. I remember reading an article in the Houston Chronicle. And this was in the 90s when I was teaching there. And it said uh, that it costs about $36,000 for each prisoner uh, in the incarceration per year. And at that time, as an assistant professor, I wasn't making a whole lot more than $36,000 a year. And I thought, won't it be cheaper or more beneficial and more beneficial to society to pay them $30,000 a year to stay out of jail <laughs> and contribute to the economy at least by buying something? But I asked this group to think about things which will help our students succeed. Whenever my wife and I, Joe, go out to visit with alum or friends of DePaul, the one thing I asked for, I said, you may not be able to help us financially at this point. Help us with internships. Internships lead to jobs. Internships give our students a glimpse as to what could be for them. Okay. And that's very important from our standpoint as an institution. Okay. With that, I'd like to thank you for your, uh, uh, for your uh, silence. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is not like my typical class when I used to teach. Uh, I usually have, no one really was texting, so that's good. But again, uh, but again thank you. And one side note, uh, when I was asked to be, shortly after I was announced as president at DePaul, guess what the first email I got was? I got one email almost immediately after my announcement. Huh? Cubs or socks? Not Cubs or socks. I was asked that more than once. So I'm a Bears, Black Hawks, <laughs> and Bulls fan. Uh, actually, the first email I got was someone asking, uh, what are you going to do about basketball? <laughs> Again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esteban. Yes, Don't go away. Thank you very much. And now we uh, open up the floor to uh, questions. Um, any members of our City Club staff, you have a few questions there? Alex, if you'd bring them over. And I know uh, Charlie Gardner, the trustee of Roosevelt University, he has a question here. So I see that. Now, you know, this is the city club, sir. Okay. So you never quite know what you're going to get. Okay. okay? I had nothing to do with it. Absolutely. <laughs> this one, I don't know. We can't even read it. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Richard Wolf. It came through the internet, by the way. He wants to know, what is DePaul's commitment to sustainable ocean and land environments. Here you thought you would be asked about the Chicago River and Lake Michigan, but now we have one about the ocean. Yeah. Uh, as an institution, DePaul's uh, involved in environmental science. That's one of the areas which we've tried to make uh, significant investments in. Uh, in part, now, if you ask me specifics about ocean, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not that familiar with the environmental science and all the areas they're involved in, but I do know as an institution we are committed. Uh, we try and have our buildings LEED certified, among other things. So that's something which I expect all institutions actually in the state to be heavily involved in. So. Okay, thank you. This is a very uh, good question. It comes from uh, Lynn Merrick. Um, 
There's a federal tax proposal to place a 1.4% excise tax on universities with large endowments like uh, Harvard, Yale, Northwestern, University of <laughs> Chicago, etc. Um, what do you think of that idea? Okay. Uh, I wish we were at the poll at the point where we could be taxed. <laughs> Uh, uh, maybe after today we will get uh, <laughs> to that point. Uh, but uh, seriously now, uh, why are we taxing our future? I mean, uh, to me, and I I've heard the pros and cons. I've heard, well, you should spend X percent of your endowment. So, uh, sometimes you don't get to spend the money until it's fully endowed. People give gifts over time, for example. So you typically wait till the money's all there, then you spin off it's typically 4.5%. Okay. Now, to me, the bigger question is, having seen all of this and social mobility, why don't, you, why don't people give more to institutions such as DePaul, which do a good job in terms of social mobility? Everyone wants to give to the so-called IVs, the big schools. Okay, the, but let's face it. A, a million dollar gift, a ten million dollar gift to a school like DePaul or to any of my counterparts who are here with us today means a whole lot more to institutions which have thirty billion dollar endowments. Okay, thank you. That was a, must be a popular topic, Dr. Esteban, <laughs> because Linda Shapiro with Conlon and Dunn had the very same question. Okay, thanks Linda. I think uh, Dr. Esteban addressed that. <clears throat> this is from Charlie Gardner, who's a trustee of Roosevelt University. He wants to know if he's correct. Why are your first year retention rates falling over the last six or seven years from almost 90% to less than 75%? Okay, the CPS, I mean, uh, I assume it has to do with the CPS. Dr. Gardner right here. Yeah. Yeah, the CPS, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're actually looking at this fall as to the reason for it. Uh, uh, we're looking at the, the academic profile of the students. We think it's a combination of academic profile, plus there was some uncertainty over MAP. For institutions which have a lot of MAP, there was a time we had close to 5,000 MAP students. We're now down to about 3,800. It's the uncertainty year to year which has some impact. I'm not saying it's all uh, that, and we're also looking at the academic profile of the students we admitted this year, uh, last year uh, versus previous classes. So. Okay, um, where do you hope DePaul will be in four or five years in terms of the programming, colleges, and new majors in the coming years? This is from City Club member Jill Stewart, who's affiliated with your university, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a loaded question in a way because we're going through strategic planning uh, as an institution. And for those of you in higher ed, uh, the last thing you want to do is say, this is what we're going to do okay, as a president. So we're going through that strategic planning process as we speak. Uh, we should have a plan before our board by the May time frame. And in that, we're going to talk about our future. But I challenged our strategic planning group, actually. I said, I'm really not that interested in five, six years. I'm more interested in the year 2030. I'm more interested in 20, 30 years down the road. In what, and questions like, what will make sure that DePaul's going to be around for the next 120, 125 years. Uh, so the ups and downs temporarily do not concern me. Uh, the only thing I said publicly uh, is that uh, uh, we really do not have at DePaul a presence in healthcare. Okay. We have a, a second degree option in nursing, but that's it. So the question is, do we get into healthcare? What form, fashion does that take, and so on. So that's that's just part of that overall discussion. We may decide, no, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Okay. Um, we must have some fans here. <laughs> this is from City Club member Elsie Sai Nibar. Um, she happens to be Filipino. 
<laughs> and she says that um, she's very proud of you as being the first Filipino American president of DePaul University. So I think we all are. Yeah. And I bet Elsie's Tagalog <laughs> is a lot better than my Tagalog. So good question. Um, are you the first Filipino American president of a university in the United States, by any chance? Uh, when, I, when I became president at Seton Hall, I was the first uh, Filipino American president of a uh, U.S. Uh, university. So, very good. Um, now, so those are two kind of easy questions. <laughs> Let's talk about your new Wind Trust Arena. Yeah. Yeah. Over the years, mm -hmm. when you were a much smaller university, mm -hmm. and you had some fantastic basketball teams and great coaches and Ray Meyer and the Meyer mm -hmm. family. Alumni Hall on Belden Avenue was always packed. Uh -huh. Then DePaul moved out to the All-State Arena. A lot of empty seats. Yeah. Poor teams and maybe more important students didn't want to travel from yeah. the Lincoln Park campus out to Rosemont. Do you have any indication that they'll be willing to travel from the campus now to that wonderful building an arena. I was in it last week for a <laughs> musical event. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts about this? Based on at least the excitement, initial ticket sales and so on, it looks like we have a winner, so to speak, in Wintrust Arena. It's very convenient to get to. Uh, we've been there a few times and it's always a toss up between taking the red or green line and uh, uh, or driving. And driving is probably the least preferable of our options. So I think our students, we actually have 13,000 students in the Loop campus versus 10,000 in Lincoln Park. So it's actually, we have more students uh, downtown than we'd have in Lincoln Park. I think it's going to be convenient. Uh, I think it's about uh, com uh, fielding a competitive team, but I think with the facilities we have here. And, uh, and I'll just talk briefly about my experience. We went through the same thing at my previous institution. Uh, once we moved into the new facilities in 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, it took six years, but the hall went back uh, to the tournament for the first time since 06 as Big East Championship in 2016. And I know Jeannie's here. Uh, so Jeannie, when did you guarantee that we'd be <laughs> in the tournament again? Uh, but it's about finding the, making sure you have the right coach, you recruit the right kids, the right student athletes. Because we're primarily student athletes, not athlete students. And that's more important to us than anything else. But I think with the new arena, everything else, it's going to be great. Uh, we expect to be at most of the games, actually. Come so. see us beat Notre Dame before full house. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jeannie. Where is Jeannie? OK. She left, oh, I'm sorry. Because oh. her husband, Joe, is a great yeah. attorney. And he was a pretty fair basketball player at <laughs> Okay. Um, and how important is having a good representative team to the overall academic efforts at a school like DePaul? One of the things we're most proud of, of our athletic program is the fact that we beat all other big teams, Big East teams in terms of academics. Okay. So that was very important last year. Uh, we had eight academic uh, uh, Big East teams, so to speak, which meant we were top for eight of the categories. Graduation rate and so on and so on. But we also realized the importance of having competitive teams because it does bring awareness. Okay, we're on Fox National. We're on Fox Regional, CBS Regional. So we have opportunities to have the name of DePaul out there. So we're launching our new ad campaign, doing all of that uh, in the very near future. Uh, and you want to feel, be competitive, okay? And I think right now, uh, just based on the young men we have, young women we have, because our women's team is always very competitive. So, uh, okay. Let's give Dr. Esteban a big round of applause. Don't leave.
Don't leave.